Okay, so guys, today what we're going to do is we're going to talk about how solutions form. Um, we talked about this last year um, with Miss Call and I, um, but obviously today we're going to do a much deeper dive. And guys, we're going to answer a very important question today, um, which is simply, why does salt dissolve in water, but oil doesn't? So fundamentally, we're going to ask and answer the question, why do some things dissolve in water where other things don't? And guys, we couldn't have that conversation last year because you didn't understand thermochem. You didn't understand endo and exothermic. You didn't understand the formation and breaking of interactions, whether they be bonds or intermolecular forces. Guys, you didn't have the background last year to have this conversation, but now you do. And so we can now ask that question, why does some stuff dissolve in water and other stuff doesn't? Now guys, along the way, the first thing we've got to do is establish some shared terminology. So guys, I would just encourage you, if you don't know these things, to write them down. So guys, when we talk about solutions, tell me you're okay with this. Solute and solvent, right? Solute is the thing doing the dissolving. Solvent is the thing, I'm sorry, solvent is the thing doing to the dissolving. Solute's being dissolved. So guys, for this conversation that we're gonna have today, we're gonna talk about liquid solvents, water, cyclohexane in lab, whatever that might be. And then guys, our, our solutes are gonna be all three phases. We're gonna watch the salt and water video and that would be a solid. But eventually we're going to talk about liquids in liquids and gases in liquids. So guys, these then are the terms that are probably less familiar and I'm just going to lay them out there for you. You'll probably want to write them down and then we're going to use them in context. So guys, as we talk about solutions, the first thing you need to know, the first term you're going to need to be able to use is the term solvation. So guys, when we talk about solvation, we are talking about the clustering of solvent particles around a solute particle. And sadly, right now, many of your minds are going to the video and you can almost picture those water molecules surrounding the green and gray ions. That's sad, but it's good. Because that's solvation. But guys, when we talk about solvation, when the solute is water, we give it a different name. We don't call it solvation, we call it hydration. So hydration is solvation when water is the solvent. Oh my gosh. No, I screwed the lid off my coffee cup to tell you about how these things work, and I didn't screw it on straight. <laughs> I'm like, wait, I'm drinking and I'm wet. <laughs> and those usually don't go hand in hand. <laughs> Man. Oh. Yeah, luckily these aren't going to help. <laughs> Blindly, I reach for paper towels with very high hopes. And yeah, it's just pushing it around. But when you, here's chemistry, when you spread it out, increase surface area and therefore, right. So it actually doesn't lap the stuff up. It just spreads it out and then it evaporates more quickly. Okay, so guys, third term you need to know saturated solutions so let me look I forget which definition I'm going to give you for this yeah um, let me give this to you but there, there's an even better definition that that I, I, I learned this from a, a colleague and it's brilliant so guys when you think of something that's saturated can you kind of picture it just being all full up so guys, when we talk about a saturated solution, we're talking about a solution where you can't add any more solute. It's literally all full up. 
So when you create a saturated solution, you can keep adding solute, but no more of it will dissolve and it just remains as a solid. So functionally, it means you just can't get any more to dissolve. Hey, thank you. Does that, are you okay with that? So guys, this is subtle, but check this out. The technical definition for a saturated solution, are you done writing so you can hear this? This is cool. I, I remember hearing this and going, that's neat. Okay, you ready? So this is actually the technical definition of a saturated solution. A solution in contact with its solute. Isn't that interesting? So if you, and you, I mean, write it down if you want, but that's, but guys, that is the technical definition of a saturated solution. It's a solution in contact with its solute. Because if it was in contact with its solute and it wasn't saturated, what would happen? It would dissolve. So the fact that the solution is in contact with its solute means that no more can dissolve and therefore it's saturated. Huh? That's pretty good. I remember, I, I remember, it's just, it stuck with me. Okay, so then guys, relative to this idea is the concept of solubility. Now guys, in this context, when we say solubility, we don't mean yes or no. Will it dissolve? What we mean is how much. So guys, solubility is the amount of solute needed to create a saturated solution at a given temperature. You're going to find out that it's temperature dependent. It, yeah, it's an, and actually, Addy, that's awesome. Not only is it a number, the units, for some weird reason, and I don't know why, the units tend to be in grams of solute per 100 milliliters, typically, of water, solvent. So the units tend to be, like, I don't know if you remember when we did the, the, solid, the heat of solution lab, and um, some of you were pushing the upper boundaries in terms of how much salt you were adding to your water. And I know a couple of you came and said, can we really do 20 grams of salt? And I was like, let's look up the solubility. And we looked it up on Wikipedia and they're given in grams of solute per 100 milliliters of water. So anyway, it is a number. And then guys, finally, the last one that you need to know is miscible. So guys, let me put this in context for you. You understand that alcohol dissolves in water, right? If it didn't, there'd be no such thing as bartenders. So guys, alcohol dissolves in water. So imagine that you've got a cup of water and you start dumping alcohol into it. Can you dump enough alcohol into that glass that eventually no more will dissolve? And the answer is no. Um, the thought here is that when you have liquids dissolving into liquids, they will mix in all proportions. You can never saturate a liquid-liquid solution um, because what ends up happening is once you've added more solute than solvent, they just switch roles and keep going. Okay, That's what miscible means. Guys, miscible refer, uh, refers to liquids that forms solutions in all proportions. So guys, we actually technically, it's technically wrong to say that alcohol is soluble in water. We should actually say alcohol is miscible in water, um, which just means that it does dissolve. The difference is that you can't saturate liquid liquid solutions. So technically, and I think, just a second, I think it's here. Let me finish this up. Um, yeah, so alcohol and water. But then guys, technically, instead of saying that oil does not dissolve in water, we should say that water oil is immiscible in water because again, it's a liquid that doesn't dissolve in water. So um, again, it just means that it doesn't dissolve. And an example of that is oil or gasoline and things like that. So guys, these are all the terms. Let, I want everybody, I know Leah, you have a question as well. Let's let everybody get done mindlessly writing this down and then we'll do questions and then we'll start to fiddle with these ideas in more meaningful ways.
You guys okay? Go ahead, Leah. So it's not, yeah, I mean, technically, yes. Um, so if you, if you had a big jug of alcohol and you dumped water in, it dissolves. Um, so when we talk about water, water solutions, if, or I'm sorry, liquid, liquid solutions, if we're trying to identify solute and solvent, we typically consider the one that is there in abundance to be the solvent. Um, but technically, there isn't a solute and a solvent. They actually dissolve into each other. Um, and so consequently, it is technically wrong. Not that they would ever mark, I would never mark it wrong to say alcohol dissolves in water, but technically we should say it's miscible in water. So go ahead. My knee jerk is no, um, yeah, but there's always an exception, right? So if you didn't hear Talmadge's question is, is there an example of a place you could saturate a liquid liquid solution? And I'd have to believe the answer is yes, just because the answer always, not, oh no, not, not that I can think of. So, all right, you guys all good on this stuff? So let's do, here we go. You ready? It's time for the video. When an ionic substance such as sodium chloride is placed in... I know, you need more Karen. It's like more cowbell. Here we go. More Karen. So, guys, what I want to do is I want to use this opportunity to really wrap our arms around everything that we now understand about what's going on in this video. So I'm going I'm to stop periodically. I also want to switch to white so that I can write on here. Um, so guys, first question is this, what forces do you see at play currently in this still? Ionic bonding, right? Okay. Water, water molecule. Now what forces do we see at play? What's going on here? No, 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 what's going on here? Covalent bonding, what's going on here? Hydrogen forces, what's going on here? Ionic bonding, and now what's going on here? Ion dipole, right? Okay, so now guys, we've got a lot of forces at play. We've got this, and, and maybe I'll just, so that we're clear on this, guys, thinking about forces between particles, we've got this, which is ionic bonding, we've got this, which is hydrogen forces, and then we've got this, which is ion dipole. So guys, as we watch this video, I want you to be focusing on those three forces. So we do have, you know, the covalent bonds here, but it doesn't play a part in this conversation. So guys, keep your eye on hydrogen forces, holds the water together. Ionic bonding holds the salt together. And then ion dipole holds the salt and water together. We're looking at our together forces. interact with the ions on the surface. If the salt is soluble, the attractive interactions with water molecules overcome the ionic attractions within the lattice. The solvated ions... Hear that word? Solvated ions. So guys, when we talk about solvated ions, which is a word we've heard a thousand times and never focused on, what does solvation mean? Read your notes. It's the clustering. And guys, you can see the clustering taking place. Move off the surface and become separated in solution. Notice that water molecule. Then we focus on the clustering. So guys, it's at this point that we can really talk about what's going on. So we have the solvation here, we have the solvation here, but because this is water, we use a more specific term. It's not solvation, it's hydration and we see what we would call these hydrated ions surrounded by these water molecules and again what are the forces that hold them together ion dipole forces are you guys comfortable with all those ideas okay so we can let this play cluster through. about the anions with the hydrogens directed toward the negatively charged ion on the other hand Water molecules interact with the positively charged cations through the lone pairs of electrons on the oxygens. You good? OK. 
Okay, so guys, now that we've taken these terms and we've brought them to bear on this process, what I'd like to do We'll do it there. Because what I'd like to do is I'd like to ask you the big question of the day. Why does salt dissolve in water? And when I say salt, I mean NaCl, table salt. Guys, why does sodium chloride dissolve in water? And I asked the question rhetorically. But guys, the question is, why does table salt dissolve in water? You ready for the answer? Guys, the reason the table salt dissolves in water is because those forces are stronger than these forces and these forces added together. That's it. That's why salt dissolves in water. Because the force of attraction, what kind of force is that? Ion dipole. The force of attraction between the, the dipoles in the water and the ions of the salt this force of attraction is greater than the sum of the forces, the hydrogen forces, and the forces in that ionic lattice. And guys, if you're thinking about what we're thinking about, you should look at this and go, you got to be kidding me. Because guys, what do you know about hydrogen forces? Strongest intermolecular force in the neighborhood, other than ion dipole. We'll talk in a minute. Guys, what do you know about not just the ionic bonds, but the structure of that lattice? Remember when we talked about lattice energy? Crazy strong. So guys, we've got crazy strong and we've got pretty stinking strong. So what do we now know about this? It's crazy stinking strong. And guys, the reason that that is the case is actually because of this multiplying, this clustering of these water molecules around the solute. This clustering process creates such a strong intermolecular force, in this case ion dipole, that these forces of attraction are greater than the sum of these forces, and that's why it dissolves. So now just let's ask the follow-up question. Why do some salts not dissolve in water? Because this isn't true. But guys, understand that this could, this could break apart. Sorry for the pun. This could fall apart in a lot of different places. So think about it this way. Imagine that we keep the water, but we replace it with a salt. Like, for example, silver chloride. Let's replace this with silver chloride so the grays are now silver. Does silver chloride dissolve in water? It does not. Why not? What do you think changes that keeps the silver chloride from dissolving in water? Okay, so it, it's partially this. The silver chloride is a stronger lattice, but that's only part of the answer. What else changes? The ion dipole forces here, if this is a silver ion, those attractions are actually weaker and consequently this is no longer stronger than the sum of these. And literally guys, the, the, the water molecules bump into the silver chloride crystal and can't pull it apart because these forces are weaker and it's not enough to allow those water molecules to strip the silver chloride apart. Do you get the idea? So that's the interplay that we're talking about. So guys, we're going to spend a few minutes and dig more deeply into this. Go ahead, Tucker. So wait, I'm a little bit confused. Why is it that the um, ion dipole uh, forces, if this was silver chloride, mm -hmm. why is it that the ion dipole forces are weaker than if it was? Be because silver is bigger. Because silver is so much bigger, um, it, it, there's, a, there's a greater, there's a, it, it's, it's um, that, that attraction between that ion and the dipole is decreased because of the size of the silver atom. And because that's the case, it's, it's, and we could sit down and draw it, but it's a function of size. Um, understand they would never ask you to explain that. 
what they would do is they would ask you, why does silver chloride not dissolve in water? And we're gonna talk in a minute about how to describe that, but understand fundamentally it is a function of that attraction. Go ahead. It's not wrong, but we don't talk about it that way. No, but you're absolute, I mean, it's a stretch to, co to consider an ionic bond a cohesive force, but okay. Um, and this is definitely a cohesive force, right? Um, so if we can allow for ionic bonds to be cohesive, which it's really not, but your theory, your thinking's not wrong, that the inside forces are weaker than the in-between forces. That's absolutely right on. Yeah, please. Um, so like in It's a great question. So if we were to replace the sugar with salt, sorry, salt with sugar, the same thing's going on. The only difference is, is if this, it, let me clean up my mess. The only difference is, is if this was sugar, then these forces that we're overcoming would also be hydrogen forces, right? Because sugar is a carbohydrate. Carbohydrate has that oxygen hydrogen group that's bent, naked protons. So sugar crystals are held together with hydrogen forces. So you'd have hydrogen forces here, you'd have hydrogen forces here, and then you would also have hydrogen forces here. But this multiplying of solvation as those water molecules surround the sugar crystals, the sugar molecules would create a multiplication of forces that would allow it to dissolve. So if it was sugar and water, all three forces at play would be hydrogen forces. It's just that this multiplying of forces would be enough to rip it apart. I'm scared of never, but no. Yeah, yeah, you can go with never. You guys okay with this idea? Go ahead, Caleb. Yeah, no, you're fine. Forces or bonds, either one's fine. So help me understand where you're going. I don't, I don't understand your, your, where you're going. Correct, yeah. Yep. Agreed. So be careful with boiling point and melting. So high melting point, or are we talking melting point? Okay, so you're saying that because this has got hydrogen forces, which are strong, it should have a high melting point, right? So the thing you've got to be careful of is high relative to what, um, right? So for example, um, we drew a we drew a sugar carbohydrate and it's carbon with hydrogens all around it right but sorry no it's carbon with OH's on one side and hydrogens on the other do this what if you could strip off all of those OH's and just replace them with hydrogens then hydrogen bonding is no longer an option but that, that happens. Those are actually what are called hydrocarbons, and they tend to be, that's, so gasoline is an eight carbon chain with hydrogens all around it. But you know from experience, gasoline is a liquid at room temperature. But if you could take off those hydrogens and replace them with OHs, you'd then get a carbohydrate, still eight carbons long, but that would be a solid. Um, so when you're talking about melting point being high, it is higher than it would be if the OHs weren't there, um, but it's still not as high as something like salt, which is an ionic bond. So understand high is a relative term, but if you were asked, what is an eight, do you guys know the name of an eight carbon sugar? Six is glucose, right? C6H12O6. What is, anyway, you could look up an eight carbon sugar, C8H16O8, and you would find out that its melting point is much higher than gasoline. Obviously, because gasoline is a liquid and it would be a solid. So, you guys good on these ideas? Okay, so guys, please do not go too far with this. And don't even write this down, please. But this is the idea. This is how we think about this idea of dissolving. So the idea is we break it into three processes. 
thinking, let's do this. Let's think about dissolving salt in water. So we have the separating of the solute particles. Guys, salt and water, what are these forces that hold the solute together? Think about it. Solute and solvent, salt dissolving in water, what forces hold the solute together? Ionic bonds. Okay, now we've got to separate the solvent from each other. What forces hold the waters together? Hydrogen forces. By the way, guys, do not do that on the test. Don't call them H forces. Write out the word hydrogen. Then, guys, what about the solute-solvent interactions? What are those? Ion dipole. Now, guys, all that I want to do, dipole, yeah, okay. So, guys, all I want to do now is give these things direction. So, when we break something, because you know about thermochemistry, when we break something, that's always endothermic, right? Always? Yes, always. When we break something, that's always endothermic. And when we form interactions, that's always exothermic, right? Okay. Guys, that then leads us, yeah, uh, you know what? I don't want to show that to people anymore. I'm getting rid of that. Because people look at this and they're like, oh, that's an equation. And that has steps. And that's the way this works. And that's not true. So we're getting rid of that. Oh, no, it wasn't, wasn't worth the confusion. So guys, are we okay with endo, endo, and exothermic? Then talk to me. No, you understand that, right? Separate, separate. You know, I want to get rid of that one too. Oh, yeah. We can do this. We're in charge. So we're going to get rid of this. That's gone. Now we can talk. So, guys, that's all right. We can deal with, we, we can deal with confusing. Guys, this is the idea. So on the left and on the right, we have the solution processes for two different salts. So all this is, is a retelling, I'm going to switch to red. This is a retelling of what we just talked about. So guys, here's the idea. Here's our salt in our water. The beginning of the video. And then we talked about the idea that what, is, what did the solvent have to do? Separate. What does the solute have to do? Separate. So we are going to call this amount of energy number one, where the solute particles are separated. What just broke right here? Ionic bonds and the lattice. Then, guys, we've got to separate the solvent particles. What just broke right there if this is water? Hydrogen forces. Then the solute and solvent get together and a bamboozle of energy is released. And what are these forces? Ion dipole, right? Now, guys, if we look at the one on the left, we see the same thing. Solute and solvent break apart the solute, break apart the solvent, and then the thing dissolves. Or, and then the, so we've got... Um, We've got uh, ionic and the lattice. Then we've got hydrogen forces. And then we've got ion dipole forming here. Here's the difference. The one on the left is soluble and the one on the right is not. Do you see why? Because this is the big idea. In order for a salt to dissolve in water, the solution that is formed will have less energy than the solute and solvent had alone. That's the idea that this has got to be bigger than the sum of these. Remember when we drew that into the video? That's the idea, that the force of association has got to be greater than the sum of the forces of dissociation. Here you'll notice that's not the case. The solution has more energy than the pieces did on their own, and this will not dissolve because the attraction is not great enough to overcome the attractions within the solute and the solvent themselves. Do you get the idea? Go ahead. 
Correct. Right, right, right. Good. Yeah. And that's where I wanted to go with this. Because guys, when we talk about this idea, understand that there are subtle differences, right? And one of those, I'm glad you thought of that, is our quick cold pack. Because remember when I introduced you to that quick cold pack, we said, wait a minute, this is cold. This thing is net endothermic and yet it still dissolves. So understand that in this region, there's a little bit of a gray area, but what explained that gray area? Area where these salts could dissolve and increase in entropy. Exactly. So there is a gray area right here, but realize that these this wouldn't happen. If our, if our solution was way up here and there was a huge difference in energy, that would not dissolve. So if they're close, entropy can break the tie, but if they're hugely different, it will not happen at all. Okay. And we can describe that because we can talk Gibbs free energy, right? And then we're talking spontaneity that includes entropy, but I've never seen them bring that into this conversation. You guys good on all of this? Okay, so guys, what we're going to do then is we are now going to sort of talk about how these ideas all come together. So this is where you need your attention and then grab that sheet of paper that I gave you or throw it on the floor, either one's fine. You guys all, did I, Josh, did I get you one? Okay, so guys, this is the idea. When we understand dissolving, it is the interplay of, is this too abstract to do it this way? It's the interplay of break down the solute, break down the solvent, and then what the solute and solvent do to each other. Do you get the idea? Is that okay? Okay. Because guys, we ask, and, and we can answer from this, why do some salts dissolve in water where others don't, right? So why does NaCl dissolve in water where AgCl doesn't? But guys, we can expand this conversation into so much more than that. And when we do we get to have some, some really interesting conversations. And guys, it's all based on this. You'll notice that I've given you most of the information, but there is stuff I'm gonna ask you to fill in. So guys, this expands this conversation beyond why does NaCl dissolve in water and why does AgCl not? And it expands the conversation into things like, why does oil not dissolve in water, but it does dissolve in gasoline? Do you guys know that? That water dissolves in gasoline, but I'm sorry, oil dissolves in gasoline, but it does not dissolve in water. So guys, if you ever work on your own car and your hands get all greasy, you can run your hands under water all day and they're never gonna get clean. But if you get a gas can and soak a rag in gas and use that to wipe off your hands, all the oil comes right off. So why does oil dissolve in, or actually another trick you can do is use Vaseline. I don't know if you know this or not. But if your hands are all greasy, take some Vaseline, rub the Vaseline into your hands and then wipe off the Vaseline and the oil comes off with it. So why does oil dissolve in gasoline and dissolve in Vaseline? You guys know Vaseline and gasoline come from the same place. Yeah, crude oil. Um, Vaseline is actually the very heaviest fractions of crude oil. Anyway, that's why it's called petroleum jelly. You're learning so much, but okay. So guys, why does this work? And the answer is the interplay between polar solutes and polar solvents. So guys, if you can picture, let's, let's, let's pick our players. So guys, for our polar solute, we're gonna say that that's salt, table salt. Is that okay? It's so polar, it's ionic. For our nonpolar solvent, we're gonna go, or I'm sorry, for our nonpolar solute, we're gonna go with oil. Then guys, for our polar solvent, we're gonna go with water. And for our nonpolar solvent, we're gonna go with gasoline. So guys, let's talk ahead of time. Does salt dissolve in water? Yes. Does oil dissolve in water? No. This one's interesting. Does salt dissolve in gasoline? It doesn't. Does oil dissolve in gasoline? It does. Now we're gonna talk about why. 
So guys, let's start in the upper left-hand quadrant and let's do this. So guys, thinking about our solute, thinking about the salt, what holds salt together? Ionic bonds. And those are really strong, right? So guys, our solute-solute interactions are really strong. Now, what about our solvent-solvent interactions? What are the forces that hold water together? Hydrogen forces. Those are also really strong. But guys, when, when ions get together with these very polar water molecules, we end up with ion dipole forces, and those things are really strong, and there's a lot of them. And because these forces are really, really strong, this thing is soluble. Okay, so now guys, let's think about oil. What do you know about the intermolecular forces in oil? Big, long, fat, nonpolar molecules. Are the intermolecular forces weak or strong? They're actually weak, so why doesn't it boil? Why does oil not just evaporate? Because the molecules are so stinking fat, they can't get out. But guys, the intermolecular forces are relatively weak. So inside of oil, Inside of oil, guys, the, uh, the intermolecular forces are weak. Now, what about inside of water? Well, those are hydrogen-hydrogen forces. Those are strong. But guys, what about this? When water, when polar water comes up against a big, big old polar nonpolar water molecule or oil molecule. So guys, if you got a big old nonpolar oil molecule and water comes along, what does water have to grab onto? Nothing. Guys, why, why, so think about an oil molecule. It's very non, it's very, very symmetrical. So guys, why does oil have intermolecular forces at all? What kind of forces are they? They're induced dipole, right? So guys, there are these induced dipoles, but if your only polarity is induced dipole, water can't grab a hold of that because there isn't a polarity to grab a hold of because that polarity is moving all the time and there's nothing for water to grab a hold of. As a result, the solute-solvent interactions are very weak and this doesn't dissolve. Some of them do dissolve a little, but we, we call it not appreciable. Yeah. Um, then guys down with uh, nonpolar. So guys, now we've got salt in gasoline. So guys, gasoline is also a very uh, symmetrical molecule. Um, the only intermolecular forces in gasoline um, are weak uh, induced dipoles. But again, guys, in the solute, we've got ionic bonds. So we've got really strong ionic bonds in the solute, and then we've got these weak induced dipoles in the gasoline. So why does salt not dissolve in gasoline? Well, guys, now imagine this. You've got this salt crystal in the bottom of a tank of gas, and these salt molecules are just sloshing back and forth, and they've got a little bit of polarity, but that doesn't do any good to try to rip salt apart, right? Because this polarity is always shifting, and because the polarity in the gas molecule is always shifting, it never has a chance to form a strong attraction with these ions, and it can't pull it apart. So the solute-solvent interactions are very weak, and therefore it doesn't dissolve. So now guys, this one's interesting. What about oil in gas? Guys, what forces hold the gas together? Induced dipoles. What forces hold the oil together? Induced dipoles. So in our solvent and our solute, we have weak induced dipole forces. But what happens when they get together? And guys, the thing that's interesting is they start to induce dipoles in each other. 
And as they induce dipoles in each other, you get a solvating process taking place where they begin to surround each other and you get a multiplying of forces that creates a strong, it's not strong, but it's strongish. And it's strong enough to get the solute and the solvent to intersperse with each other and they are in fact soluble. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a, it's a really good question. And um, so it could. Cody, your, answer, your question's brilliant. So if you got this water oil molecule that's doing this, and that water molecule comes along, it could create a permanent dipole in that molecule, right? But it's only for that one molecule. And in order for us to think of something as dissolving, that phenomenon has to expand beyond the molecule by molecule level to expand to the macro scale and, and billions of molecules. And at that point, there's just no consistency to it and it doesn't dissolve. Do you see what I'm, does that make sense? Yeah. So guys, go ahead. Ionic bonds. There is no IMF. It's ionic bonds, and the and the crystal lattice. Yeah, yeah. So, guys, the question then becomes this: There's a trend to this. What dissolves in what? Polar solvents dissolve polar solutes, and nonpolar solvents dissolve nonpolar solutes. Guys, in the world of chemistry, we break that down into a very succinct summary. Like dissolves like. It's worth writing down. Guys, we summarize that with the idea that like dissolves like. Now, guys, here's the deal. Use that as a predictor. Do not use it as an explanation. You're going to see a question on the test probably, that says, why does sugar dissolve in water? If you write down like dissolves like, that's really easy to grade because I just have to write a zero. So guys, why does sugar dissolve in water? Well, you have got to establish the intermolecular forces in all three settings. So you need to say water exhibits hydrogen forces. Sugar exhibits hydrogen forces, but because that's true, the water and the sugar together exhibit stronger hydrogen forces that allow the sugar to dissolve into the water. You don't get to say like dissolves like. You can use it as a predictor, but you can't use it as the explanation. So if they talk about why does oil not dissolve in water, how do you talk about that? Well, you say water contains hydrogen forces. Oil contains induced dipoles, but these induced dipoles are not strongly attracted enough to the water to allow the oil to dissolve. See how you talk about that? Guys, don't go with like dissolves like. It's a dead end. Okay, you guys good on all of this? Okay, so guys, we've got a couple more things to talk about, and this is actually where this stuff gets interesting. So what we're going to do now is we're going to talk about the things that affect the, temp the, the, the amount of stuff that can dissolve in water. So we're going to talk about the factors that affect solubility, and we're going to tell some practical stories. So guys, the first one is pressure. So for these conversations, here's the deal, guys. Our solvent is going to be water, and our solutes will either be gases or solids, because we know liquids dissolve in all proportions. So if we increase the pressure of a system, the solubility of liquids and solids are not affected by pressure. But gases are. The solubility of a gas is increased as we increase the pressure. Mm 
And guys, this has a name. It's called Henry's Law. You guys okay? Let me explain to you what this means. So guys, you got a beaker full of water and you dump salt in it. And we say we make this a saturated solution. Think about this. Beaker of water, dump in salt. How do we know that we've created a saturated solution? There's crystals on the bottom. If you then stick a plunger inside that beaker and push down, no more salt dissolves. So the solubility of a solid inside of a gas or inside of a liquid is not pressure dependent. Neither is a liquid. But guys, gases are. So, um, well, rather than give you that example, um, let's do this. So the idea is the higher the pressure, the more gas will dissolve in a, in a liquid. So for example, this. Imagine if you've got a beaker full of water, and then imagine, uh, let's do a plunger. So guys, let's say that we've got some oxygen dissolved in the water. And guys, you understand that this is the oxygen that fish breathe, right? That if you're a fish swimming through the ocean, you are not breathing the oxygen in H2O. There's always oxygen dissolved in our water, and that's the oxygen the fish breathe. Yeah? Okay. So, guys, there's also oxygen up here above the water. But imagine that you shove a plunger in this, and you squish this system. What happens to some of that oxygen? It gets driven into solution. Literally what happens is, is the pressure here goes up. And as the pressure goes up, it drives the oxygen into solution. And it's harder for the oxygen to come back out of solution. And it drives more oxygen into the water. So more oxygen can dissolve in the water at higher pressure. You get the idea? But guys, if that's the case, the opposite is true as well. Um, do any of you have a can of Coke or any? No. Okay. So you can imagine. Imagine you have not a bottle of water, but imagine you have a bottle of soda and you screw the lid off. What happens? Bubbles come out, right? Why? Because of this. Because guys, when they make soda, they literally pump carbon dioxide into the bottle or the can and they carbonate the water. So they're pumping carbon dioxide into the water and then they screw on the lid and it's trapped. But then when you screw the lid off, the pressure goes down and some of the carbon dioxide cannot stay dissolved in the water anymore because the solubility goes down and that extra carbon dioxide comes out as bubbles. Huh? Have you ever heard of the bends? You guys know what the bends are? So this happens to people that are scuba divers. And so guys, you're scuba diving, you're breathing gases. And as you're breathing gases, you're going down in the water. And as you go down in the water, your body, including your blood, gets squished. The pressure goes up. As that happens, more of the air that you breathe dissolves in your blood. Now, the problem is, is if you come up too fast, that gas is no longer soluble in your blood and it forms bubbles just like screwing the lid off of a Coke. The problem is, is those bubbles can't pass through the capillaries of your body and they literally create little traffic jams in your capillaries and that hurts like crazy and you bend over because you're in pain and you'll eventually die if you don't take care of it because it short circuits your entire circulatory system. So what do we do to fix it? Yeah, you go down. The first thing you do is go down. You got to get down and you got to drive those gases back into solution. And then you come up slow. 
And the reason coming up slow works is, guys, our bodies are these magic machines. And if you go slow enough, your lungs can actually pull those, those gases out of solution at the same time that they're turning back into non-dissolved gases. And your body can compensate if you give it time. You come up too fast, you get bubbles and it's game over. Guys, all of this is what is called Henry's Law. Now let's talk about, let's talk about temperature issues. So guys, temperature is interesting. In liquid solvents, the solubility of a solid increases with temperature. And the solubility of gases actually decreases with temperature. This is where we're done today. So guys, liquid solvents, water. And so in liquid solvents, we're talking about solid solutes and we're talking about gas solutes. So guys, let's do sol... Oh, you're writing. So guys, let's do gas, let's do, let's do solid solutes first. So fundamentally, what does this mean? Well, what it means is if you have a, 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 a cup of water and if you heat up the water, more salt will dissolve in it, right? But have any of you ever made rock candy? Have you ever, I used to do this as a kid. As a, if you've never done this, the way that you do it is you dissolve sugar in water and sugar dissolves in water at room temperature but if you heat up the water more sugar can dissolve in the water so you heat the water to boiling and then you can dump an amazing amount of sugar in there and it all dissolves then guys what you do is you turn off the heat and you dangle a string into the pot of sugar water and as it cools that sugar can no longer stay dissolved in the water and it clumps onto the string and it makes really cool looking crystals that are just pure sugar and we just eat it as candy and rot our teeth out of our heads. Um, but it's, it's that idea that then as that water cools the sugar comes out. So we're not going to do this. Okay, then guys, what about gases? Well, guys, interestingly, as you increase the temperature of a liquid, less gas can dissolve in the liquid. Think about it. If we've got water and if we've got oxygen up here, we've already said that if we increase the pressure, it makes the oxygen go into solution, right? But guys, what if instead of increasing pressure, what if we increase the temperature? What if we shove that on a Bunsen burner? So as the temperature goes up, what happens to these water molecules? They move faster. But what also happens to the oxygen molecules that are dissolved in the water? They also move faster and they go away as well and less can stay dissolved in the water. You get the idea? Go ahead, Caleb. then understand what would happen is you would, you would, well, you couldn't be. If for this to happen, you would see an increase in pressure up here or else that, that has to happen. If you increase this temperature, you have to increase pressure. Although if you took the lid off, then it all just goes away. Um, what you're going to find out, guys, is in lab, um, when we start doing acid and base chemistry, we are going to boil all of our water before we use it to make acid-base solutions because in water, oh gosh, in water, there's actually carbon dioxide dissolved. And that carbon dioxide actually messes around with the pH of the water. So when we make our acid and base solutions, we'll actually boil the water first. That drives all the carbon dioxide out. And then we'll use that to make our solutions because it get rid of the CO2. Get the idea? One more interesting application to this. Do any of you fish? 
why do you not fish in the middle of a hot, sunny summer day? Guys, the reason is because the fish are suffocating. Seriously. Guys, the fish are suffocating because in the middle of the day, the sun and the water and the surface of the water is hot. And when water molecules bounce into the surface of the water, they don't stick and dissolve. They actually bounce. And the, the amount of oxygen in the water in the middle of the day actually decreases. And the fish can't feed because they can't be active because they don't have enough air to breathe. And then at night, guys, the water reabsorbs a bunch of this air because it's cooling off and these molecules are more likely to dissolve into the water. And so in the cool of the morning, in the cool of the evening, there's more oxygen for the fish to breathe and they can go find stuff to eat. Huh? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So much to think about. I know. See, hey, so guys, one more thing. There is one thing in the notes that we are not going to get to today, but what we will do is we will pick up next time with it, and it is not in the homework anyway, and this is your homework, and we will go when the bell rings.